In the Gospel of Luke, we learn that after teaching in the temple during the day, Jesus spent his nights in the Mount of Olives. Jesus and the apostles had to cross a brook to get there. It was a pleasant place. Since this place of rest was known only to Jesus' inner circle, it was one of comfort and security for the Lord. It provided an aura of seclusion and peace. It was in this place, however, that the Bible makes its only reference to the agony of Jesus, for it was here that Jesus would be betrayed, it was here that Jesus would engage in a cosmic struggle for the life of the world. In Mark 14 we read that Jesus took Peter and James and John with him, and he began to fear and to be heavy. He said to them, quote, My soul is sorrowful, even unto death. He was in the garden, and although it was not seen, a trial of sorrow and death had come upon him. The first Adam had been overcome by the serpent in a garden, the Garden of Eden. In Genesis 3 we read that prior to Adam's fall, the devil convinced Eve that if she ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, she would not die the death. Satan persuaded Eve that death would not be the result of eating of the tree. Yet death was exactly what was at stake. Eve was overcome by the devil, and she decided to eat. She then gave the fruit of the tree to her husband, who did the same. When Adam ate the fruit, mankind was plunged into the state of death and sorrow, eternal death and eternal sorrow. Scripture tells us that one of the punishments for Adam and Eve's disobedience was precisely sorrow and the multiplication of sorrows. Quote, I will multiply thy sorrows. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children. Genesis 3.16 To Adam God said, quote, Cursed is the earth in thy work, in sorrow and toil shalt thou eat thereof all the days of thy life. Genesis 3.17 Adam's failure in the garden resulted in sorrow and death. It produced all the sorrows and all the deaths in history, and most significantly, the death of the soul. Is it a surprise, therefore, that the new Adam, Jesus Christ, true God and true man, who was charged with restoring what Adam had forfeited, was faced with a special trial in the garden? Is it a surprise that, in the garden, he underwent an inscrutable suffering, one that was characterized by unimaginable feelings of sorrow? These were so profound that his sorrow moved him to the very point of death. In the face of this agony, Jesus fell flat on the ground. Quote, and when he was gone forward a little, he fell flat on the ground, and he prayed, that if it might be, the hour might pass from him. And he saith, Father, all things are possible to thee. Remove this chalice from me, but not what I will, but what thou wilt. Mark 14:35-36. It is reasonable to conclude that Jesus, who had the weight of the whole world's sins on his shoulders, was afflicted with every sorrow and every death in history. Every sin, every lie, every murder, every theft, every betrayal, every fornication, every drunken stupor, every instance of unbelief, every act of idolatry or iniquity, with all the misery and death each one produced, was foisted upon him. As Hebrews 2.14 says, he was burdened with destroying the empire of death. In 2 Corinthians 12, 7-8, we read that God allowed an angel of Satan to buffet St. Paul. The disturbance caused was so great that St. Paul asked the Lord three different times to deliver him. If a single angel of hell can cause such a disturbance, what kind of sorrow and misery would Jesus have endured in overcoming all the angels of hell? and of restoring the entire world after Adam's sin? Isaiah prophesied that Jesus would be a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, Isaiah 53. Jesus' agony occurred in the Mount of Olives, in the Garden of Gethsemane. 
The name Gethsemane comes from a word meaning oil press. In an oil press, oil is extracted from olives as they are slowly crushed between two large rocks. As the olives are pressed and crushed, the oil pours out. In the same way, as Jesus was crushed under the pressure of the world's sins, blood poured out from his head. Quote, and there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed the longer, and his sweat became as drops of blood, trickling upon the ground. And when he rose up from prayer, and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. Luke 22, 43-45 The condition of sweating blood is called hematodrosis. Dr. Frederick Zugibi says, quote, Around the sweat glands there are multiple blood vessels in a net-like form. Under the pressure of great stress, the blood vessels constrict. Then, as the anxiety passes, the blood vessels dilate to the point of rupture. The blood goes into the sweat glands, coming out as droplets of blood mixed with sweat." End quote. In a doctor at Calvary, page 160, Pierre Barbet says, quote, It is produced, as Dr. Lebec has written, in very special conditions, great physical debility accompanied by violent mental disturbance, followed on profound emotion or great fear. Dread and horror are here at the maximum, and so is mental disturbance." End quote. The Garden of Gethsemane, as recorded in Luke 22, is the only place in the Bible where we see Jesus described as being in agony. His suffering was so great that the epistle to the Hebrews describes these moments as the days of his flesh, and his cry to the Father is a strong cry, Hebrews 5, 7. An angel was sent to strengthen him in this combat of infinite ramifications. The drops of blood not only exited his pores and became visible, but they were so profuse that they trickled on to the ground, Luke 22:44. His sorrow and agony permeated the area and was noticed by his apostles. For when Jesus rose up, he found them sleeping out of sorrow. They must have been overwhelmed by confusion and distress upon seeing their master so greatly troubled. After trying to keep them awake to watch with him, Jesus tells them to sleep and take their rest. Only a superior charity can encourage others to rest when he has to work, can relieve the stress of another when he is crushed under his own. We also read that being in agony, Jesus prayed the longer. Only Jesus could press forward in prayer when the weight of the entire world is pressing him back, can put out more effort when everything inclines him to rest. Jesus also went a stone's throw away from the apostles so that he could pray. He faced the struggle in solitude to teach us how we must pray and find God. As the trial in the garden moved to a close, Jesus rose up quickly. He knew what was to come next. He moved with alacrity toward it. His adversary had arrived, with a multitude carrying swords and clubs. Jesus must have considered with deep anguish how the chief priests had sought by every crafty means they could to get a hold on him. Mark 14.1 Now their wicked design had come to fruition. Judas had arrived, and he was to deliver Jesus to his enemies with a kiss. All of the treachery in history, every act of insincerity, phoniness, and deceit, must not have compared to that event. Showing his divine power, as soon therefore as Jesus had said to them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. John 18.6 For no man takes his life from him. He lays it down of his own accord. John 10.18 The bright lanterns and fiery torches of those who accompanied Judas made the scene even more disconcerting. They stole whatever peace had remained from the night. It was Satan who had entered into Judas. Luke 22.3 He who takes peace and goodness from the earth. One of the greatest sufferings in life that one can experience is the knowledge that you are right yet being considered wrong. 
of being innocent, yet declared guilty, of thirsting for justice, yet not having your fill, of resisting evil pursuers, but then falling into their hands. Jesus was now in the hands of those who despised him to the core, those who dedicated their lives to his destruction. They were not of the Father because they were not of the truth. He understood the depth of their malice infinitely better than anyone. They hated him simply because they were of darkness, and he was the light. And the hour of darkness had arrived. Quote, when I was daily with you in the temple, you did not stretch forth your hands against me. But this is your hour. This is the reign of darkness. Luke 22, 53. As the armed multitude set upon Jesus to take him away, the apostles fled. As it was written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. Zechariah 13.7 Every detail was fulfilled to the letter. When the apostles had entered the Mount of Olives with Jesus, they had experienced a great joy. They had just concluded singing a hymn, but that was now a world away. What remained was only confusion and desolation, as all of their expectations were shattered and Jesus was taken away alone.